Thank you, Milka. And I think you all know what I mean by that. So, uh, Milka says she's going to keep me right on time, so I'm going to go fast. And, and if you want, I, I don't know if I'm supposed to give mentoring advice, but I thought some of the sessions had great advice. In fact, I wish I had taken some of your advice early on uh, when I was starting off. But we, you're welcome to ask me questions about that as well. So, uh, you know, it hasn't been long since we've understood reproduction. This is from 1695, and, you know, Anton von Leeuwenhoek, who invented the microscope, enabled people to see sperm. And the idea at the time, of course, males, this is very male-centric, thought that little people were in their sperm, and therefore they were giving rise to little people. And the ignorance about sex persists, as you can see from these headlines. Um, they all have <laughs> flaws in their logic. Um, and I find that, uh, you know, when, we, when I talk about sperm and contraception, that there are a lot of, still a lot of misconceptions about, about it. This is what I think is the most important issue. So here's human population growth. And you can see that we're on an exponential rise. 2030, it'll be about 9 billion people. And the other thing that's going on is, is this, which is most remarkable, is the extinction rate of all species is really fast. It's about 60,000 species per year. And this, of course, is due to us. And of course, this will feed back to us as well. The more we extinguish other species by our growth, the more, the faster we'll have a difficult time as well. So these are the big extinction events. You can see that most of them are all about CO2 and volcanoes and global warming. And now we're in the, this age where, just for drama, <laughs> I put this in the most destructive agent. So just to give you a little education about reproduction, uh, pH, vaginal pH is very low. The reason is it probably kills bacteria, but as you go higher and get near the cervix, the vaginal pH goes to eight. This is because the oviduct is probably the second largest secretion of bicarb in the body after the pancreas, enormous amount of bicarb secretion, which comes out through the cervix. And that is a trigger for sperm for hyperactivation. So sperm are normally immotile in the male. They only gain motility when they're ejaculated and they first gain motility and nobody understands what triggers the first motility step. But the second step, which is this hyperactivated motility, requires a shift in pH. And in humans, a shift, uh, uh, an exposure to progesterone. And so this is the difference. It's quite a difference. In the motility. These are just normally swimming. These are bovine sperm swimming along. And this is after they're hyperactivated. The question is, what turns sperm from this behavior to that behavior? And of course, what's the advantage? So another interesting thing that people don't realize, and I, I have four daughters, and I tell this to my daughters just to put a little scare into them. The, the uh, sperm can be stored in humans in these oviductal crypts for up to a week. In crocodiles, it can last for months. In bats, it can last for a month. So that's a really interesting mystery nobody has looked at yet. The general idea that people have is that sperm get degraded by the immune system, but actually they're protected under some circumstances, and nobody understands that. It'd be really good to understand why that, that is. So uh, this is fertilization, and I'm, I'm not really a reproductive scientist. I'm an ion channel biologist, and we stumbled into this by accident, and I learned a lot myself along the way. Uh, one of the ideas that you commonly, commonly cro uh, come across is anthropomorphic is that many people think of sperm as sort of diving into or working their way into the egg, but they actually have to undergo an acrosome reaction to get through the cumulus around the egg, and that's where their vigorous nature is needed, is to sort of force their way in between the cumulus cells. But once they get to the egg, 
they release enzymes which digest the outer, and then the egg sort of engulfs them. It's not that they're forcing their way into the egg. And then if you don't undergo that acrosome reaction, you can't fertilize. So the way we got into this is we were rummaging around in the genome. We came across this gene that looked to us like it should be a sodium channel, a voltage-gated sodium channel. And, and then the closest homologue to it was this, which we call CATSPR, for cation channel of sperm. And it turned out that it is an ion channel subunit and that there are four of them. Uh, they are four different genes. This is very unusual for ion channels to have four different genes make up the complex that makes the ion channel. And so there's four individual proteins around the central pore. And they're called CATSPR 1, 2, 3, and 4. They're unique. They're only in sperm. Initially, we thought maybe they'd be in hearing or something else. But it turns out that the only place they're expressed are in sperm. And so now, we, you know, this is like 15 years later, we've gradually been finding the complex. So there's four proteins, plus there's at least uh, four, maybe five accessory proteins. All of the eight seem to be absolutely required for formation of this channel. If you get mutations in any of them, the male's infertile, especially clear for each of the CATSPR subunits. This arose a long time ago. So Natchback, the sodium channel, was in bacteria. But these, this family didn't arise until the uniflagellated organisms. Um, and so they're ancient. In fact, Catsper arose with the first multicellular organisms when a tail formed in an organism to get around. And the tail developed all the cell-cell interaction proteins that are required to make a multicellular organism. And so you find it in fungi and algae, and, but then you find all of it plus additional accessory subunits. And you get more and more until you get to mammals where we have this Zeta, which we're working on now to try to figure out what this is. Sorry, some of you probably recognize <laughs> this guy. <laughs> I, I usually swap that out to put in whoever invited me as a speaker. <laughs> but the last group I was talking to was Italians, and they, they immediately recognized him and got a big laugh. At it. Anyway, so uh, anyway, if you take out any of the genes, if you knock out, we've knocked them all out. The, the sperm uh, look completely normal, their morphology is normal, but they just will not hyperactivate and therefore the mice are infertile. And this shows the difference. So this is a regular, capacitated is the name for exposing it to this high pH. And this is a CATSPR 3 knockout or CATSPR 4. If you knock out one or two or beta or gamma, you'll get the same kind of phenotype. That is, they just won't hyperactivate. So we do a lot of patch clamp, and patch clamp is, is a method used to measure the ion channels in the membrane, and sperm had never been patch clamped. They're really difficult to patch clamp. But we figured out a way to patch clamp them, and that's shown here. Sorry, it's a little too bright. But anyway, he's about, this is Yuri Kirchak. He's about to break into the cell, and right there, he's going to break in. One second. There. Breaks in and gives us access to the entire cell so we can measure the ion channel current going through the cell membrane. And so uh, that enabled us to tell what the currents were, and these are the currents, and we found out that all the currents were gone, whether you knocked out CATSPRs, one, two, three, or four. So again, the idea is that you have four different subunits. Since then, uh, this is this, what we found out is that pH, that is alkaline pH, shifted this curve so that you maximally activated CATSPR. So as the sperm reach that pH 8 near the cervix, they get activated. That's in mice. It turns out in humans that they, they have another stimulus. They also have high pH, which activates this channel, but they also progesterone activates it. And Polina Lishko recently at Berkeley, who used to work in the lab, has found a, a molecule that probably accounts for the progesterone sensitivity of the sperm in humans. So 
Uh, and lately we've been looking at uh, the distribution, and this with, is, is with Sha Wei at Harvard. And uh, normally we noticed that there was a funny distribution of this thing on the, on the sperm tail. Uh, normally uh, uh, ion channel protein and most membrane proteins are distributed homogeneously around the surface. This guy had racing stripes. We didn't see it under regular confocal, it looked kind of like a corkscrew. But when we do it under super resolution, EM, uh, sorry, super resolution light microscopy, you see that there are these racing stripes along the side. And what we're working on now is trying to understand why these calcium permeant channels, which are voltage sensitive and progesterone and pH sensitive, are injecting calcium into the structure of the sperm and what that does for hyperactivated motility. And uh, what we've found is that tyrosine phosphorylation is, is one of the main downstream endpoints for this calcium. So this is wild type, and these are phosphorylated tyrosines. If you look at the knockout, you find that tyrosine phosphorylation goes awry and it's spread out throughout the axonine. And we don't understand this yet. There's a whole kinase cascade, and we did proteomics on this and found out that there are many kinases involved downstream of this calcium step. And we're trying to understand what those kinases are doing and what that does to enable the correct movement of the sperm tail. I should, I oversimplified, and probably you got the wrong impression from the video, that the sperm tail isn't just going back and forth in a sinusoidal way, it's going in a sort of a corkscrew. And actually that corkscrew behavior gives it much more uh, force and much more motility than a simple sinusoidal back and forth. And, it's, and they're actually uh, uh, sensitive to flow, that is they flow upstream, they're rheotaxic. And so far, not much evidence that they're uh, chemotaxic as people had thought. So, you know, you start off with 20 million sperm, you end up with 20, and uh, the biggest question that we have is, what selects for those 20? It turns out that once you start hyperactivation, you set a time clock. It only la the sperm will only last for you know, an hour or two. And you, when you think about why this happens, why should there be a time clock? I think it's probably related to the fact that you don't want all the sperm, one point is you don't want all the sperm to get to the egg because you will get polyspermy, that is the egg will get fertilized by more than one sperm, which will be bad. Uh, but also, if you have these semi-protozoan-like organisms living, there's nothing to prevent them from taking up glucose and continuing to swim. And of course, there's a big gap between the oviduct and the ovary. They could colonize the perineum and act like, basically like other kinds of uniflagellar Organisms, So they have a timing mechanism in which they basically quit swimming and die and get uh, taken up. So you only get a few that make it to the egg. Our goal <laughs> is to make a new contraceptive, two minutes. Uh, our goal is to make a new contraceptive, and we've been at this a little, for a little while, uh, to block the uh, cat spurs. If we can block the cat spurs, we'll know it'll, the sperm will be 100% ineffective. You won't get fertilization. It would be a drug that would enable you to uh, depart from... Oh, I didn't know it had sound on it. <laughs> All right. It'll be, it'll be, uh, it'll enable... Uh, <laughs> first time that happened. It'll enable sperm to, uh, uh, for, for contraceptives to depart from estrogen, which has to be taken every day, and of course can have side effects and so forth. Uh, and it could be a pill that could be taken, you know, right after sex or right before sex, potentially. Wouldn't have to be taken for that long. We hope especially it's been funded by the Gates Foundation that especially it'd make a cheap contraceptive would be the goal uh, so that women in underdeveloped countries wouldn't uh, have to rely on more expensive medications. Um, but it's going to be a long time before it happens. Not because of it's going to be hard to do, but it's going to be 
as you, if any of you have gotten into biotech, you learn it's very expensive to make a drug. And so right now we're sort of in the death valley, it's called of drug development, where big pharma would need to take over. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I've talked to you guys before. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, good. Uh, so any questions? That's where, that's my short message. Yeah.